This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Now You're Talking. It's a show about the most interesting people and stories of Mississippi. I am your host, Marshall Ramsey. I'm editor-at-large and editorial cartoonist of Mississippi Today. Really, really excited about our guest today, Dr. Ann Fisher-Worth. And well, she's an award-winning American writer, poet, scholar, retired educator at the University of Mississippi in Oxford. She's won several teaching awards, including the Liberal Arts Outstanding Teacher of the Award uh, of the Year 2006, Humanity Teacher of the Year 2007, the LCM Hood Award 2014. Bottom line, she's a big deal when it comes to teaching, but she's retired now, but she's well, we'll find out a little bit more. I don't want to spill too much of the, the uh, story here. Don't want to give the ending at the beginning. Uh, but she's going to be here right now with us because she also is a 2023 Governor's Arts Award winner also for excellence in literature and poetry. And um, and it's just great to get to meet you officially on the air and get to talk to you a little bit. I'm a fan. I'm holding in my hand right now Paradise is Jagged. I finally rescued it from the post office this morning and have been <laughs> reading through it. Um, I'm a huge fan of your poetry, and, and I think I'm a big fan for two reasons. There's two things in the world I can't do. Uh, number one is I can't paint with watercolors because I just have to have a some some way of being able to correct my mistakes. And I'm not very good at writing poetry, but your poetry is just literally like my painting. I mean, when I read it, I see such vivid pictures, and it is absolutely wonderful. So I am a huge fan. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. It's really great to be here. Yeah. Were you up in Oxford over the weekend and you survived Double Decker and all the uh, good times oh, and traffic and Double people? Double Decker was great. Wasn't yeah, it wonderful? It was great. The weather was perfect. And um, we saw a couple of the artists that we really like and bought some cool stuff and heard some good music. It was really a lot of fun. Yeah. It really is. I mean, I, you know, I mean, it wasn't as, as exciting as last the last weekend when Morgan Wallen was there and there was like 100,000 people, you know, clogging up every street and so forth. But um, no, it was it was really fun, and I'm thinking about getting a tent next year. You know, we could go in together. You could you, oh, could, you could do that. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot of fun. But no, it's it really is. It's just so much fun seeing all the artists and everything else. And I think that at the end of the day, there is something about Oxford. And I know you were there. You've lived there a long time, and I know that's been a big, probably kind of cool, just because of the community and all the different writers and artists that live up that way. It is an amazing writers community. Yeah, and that's. Very much do as Square Books, the university, obviously, and the generosity of John and Renee Grisham for, you know, helping set up our wonderful MFA program and bring in writers and so on. But, I mean, Square Books is just the best, and um, writers are always wanting to come through and include Square Books on their book tours, and they're so welcoming as far as hosting and launching writers who live here. So, you know, it's great. Oh, no yeah. doubt. Yeah, no doubt. It. I mean— you know, growing up, and I lived in Georgia, and of course, Athens, Georgia was famous for its musicians and everything. And of course, Oxford just famous for the writers. And I just love going up there and I love running it because you can literally go out to eat and run into some of your favorite authors and, and get to say hello and chew the chew the fat with them and learn a little bit about it. And it's great. Uh, speaking of bookstores, and I know you've done the books uh, signing circuit as well as I have. You did see about Turnro burning uh, in I Greenwood. I did. I did. But I didn't see pictures of how bad it is. Can you tell me anything? Yeah, about I think that? structurally the building's okay. I think they're going to have to do a lot of cleaning and everything. Obviously, the stock is ruined. Um, yeah. You know, I've seen more outside pictures than inside, but they said that they were going to be able to rebuild. But uh, you'll probably agree with me that is absolutely one of the most gorgeous bookstores it's, it's I've ever so been beautiful. to. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Do you know what started the fire? I do not, you and know? I think it started after hours, so it sounded... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have to, have to actually do a little bit of reading to find out. I don't know if it was electrical or something like that, but thankfully, nobody was hurt, and I think, of course, that's yeah. the most important thing, but um, I don't know. You just... You know, when you're in the book business or when, you, when you're a writer and you see a bookstore burns, it's kind of like, you know, you just feel like somebody's just stuck a dagger in you. Yeah, I know. I know. It's just, it's really a big loss. I hope they can rebuild 
and I know they can. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I know there's a GoFundMe, too, which I don't know off the top of my head what it is, but I'll put it out on my social uh-huh. if anybody wants to make a donation on that. Well, but, that's good. Yeah. yeah. By the <laughs> way, congratulations. Um, bringing home some serious hardware with the 2023 Governor's Arts Award. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, there's a great picture of one of the artists who got the Governor's Award is raising it above his head, you know, and, like, flourishing it. And yeah. um, I tried doing that. I'm like, oh, there's no way this is coming up over my head. <laughs> takes me two hands to carry it. <laughs> it's it's a big but award. Yeah, yeah if, nobody's ever it seen is. it. Um, what does it weigh, about four, 40 pounds? I don't even know. It's beautiful. It's, it's um has a place of honor in our living room next to a bookcase on the floor, and it's as high, almost as high as the window still on the floor but it's very beautiful I'm that's, very a, happy that's amazing it. yeah yeah it was great it was great when they called i couldn't believe it i burst into tears <laughs> did you really <laughs> like, oh wow oh you're kidding oh my god i have to sit down it was that cliche like the b movie you need to sit down now you know <laughs> that's what i had to do is sit down and burst into tears it was really it was such a happy day too because the other people who got the uh, award were just so fun and so generous and so talented. And the whole mood was really festive. And Beth Ann did a great job being a, an MC. So, you know, it was just one of the happiest memories. Yeah. What a good person. Yeah. What a good person to be the MC, too. I mean, you know, because yeah. Beth, Beth Ann's pretty talented in her own right. And so it's kind of cool. Yeah. But you're right. That was just a fantastic class. I've gotten to interview several of them on the show now. And they've all had kind of the same response you have. It's like, I, I, A, I couldn't believe that the phone rang and it was that. And then, B, I just was very humbled. What was it like? I mean, seriously, you have put – you're worldwide, obviously. You've taught worldwide, and we'll touch on some of that. But, you know, obviously you've put down stakes here in Mississippi. And not only did you – if you created beautiful work that's painted pictures that just take you to different places around Mississippi. But, I mean, you've – you know, you've got family here. You've 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 – so much of your career has been here and you've taught here too to be recognized by the state and to be saying you know it's like you can go home yeah it, it, well of course i wasn't raised here you know oh, you're like me so you're, yeah you're, you're a newcomer yeah i uh, was kind of raised all over the world and then berkeley california um and we've lived here for almost 34 years so it does feel like home but um California also still feels like home. One of my kids lives there. And so it's, uh, it's, I think that's actually a good thing for me as a writer is that I always have a bit of an outside angle. You know, it's like since I didn't grow up here, I can in a way probably see things um, from that other angle, you know. So that's been helpful for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, I, I literally am. I- been here only 27 years you know i mean i moved here i guess in 96 and um and and i and i still do see things a little bit differently but you know after a while you're afraid that superpower is going to run off your dad was an army officer your mom was an english teacher yeah yeah uh so they obviously valued education and, and that rubbed off on you right yeah absolutely big readers i you know Everybody in my family read books pretty much all the time. We didn't have TV even for a long time. So what there was to do was play outside or help my mom or read books. <laughs> oh, wow. What were some of your favorite books as a kid? Oh, uh, Little Women. Mm. Um, the Freddy the Detective books about Freddy the Pig Detective. Um, Nancy Drew. I was a huge Nancy Drew fan. And um, in fact, so my dad was in Korea. He was during the war, the Korean War. And there's one Nancy Drew book where somebody gets kidnapped. And um, I can't even remember the plot, but it's like there's a big plot to introduce somebody else as him, you know? Oh, wow. And I was convinced that my dad had been kidnapped and was being held someplace in a Quonset hut because I thought Quonset huts were actually very romantic and strange. And that there was a double impersonating him. And then when we met him again in Japan, I was convinced that my mother was fooled and that this other double, you know, was not really my father. And I was trying to figure out how I should tell her. I was pretty young at the time. But um, good imagination. Nancy Drew was really messing me up, you know. So those were some of my favorites. <laughs> oh, my sisters had all the Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. It was like, it yeah. Was, yeah. So it was like the whole set. I, I guess they're still publishing yeah. those. I haven't seen those in a long time. Your dad was in Korea. You actually wrote a poem about 
uh, have written about Korea. I think it was in Paradise Jagged, if I remember correctly. I can't remember the poem. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm a little. Yeah. Like a, I, I had to kind of cram a little bit on that since they didn't deliver it like <laughs> they were supposed to. But um, Oh, yeah. But, I mean, obviously, and how old were you when Korea was going on? So that obviously left a mark on you. It did. Um, I was little. I was born in 47. So I was born because my dad survived the South Pacific. You know? Oh, wow. So he's in the South Pacific also. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was in um, New Guinea and New Zealand and ended the war in the Philippines. And um, he was gone the whole time of the war. My parents were engaged at the time. So he came home and they got married immediately and I was born a year later. Um, so, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that army past, that army childhood, you know, and I've been writing a little bit about it recently. Oh, that'll be great. I can't wait to read that as well. You know, they did settle in Berkeley, like you said. Um, I moved from San Diego, um, you know, and it was and I'm from Atlanta. So it's not like it was a total culture shock to move to the south. But I mean, I kept walking into automatic opening doors, you know, oh, because because yeah. <laughs> they open slower here, you know, that that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. But what was it like for you to make that shift and to, to come here? And how did you end up at, at, at Ole Miss? Well, <laughs> That's a long story. So Peter and I were both teaching at Virginia, and um, we were looking for jobs. And Greg Shermer, I don't know if you knew him, but he was the most wonderful chair of the English department. And Ray Mavis had recently been elected governor and had received all this, quote, excellence money for, you know, to make certain departments really excellent among the university system. And apparently he'd given money to the English department. So Greg um, could do a lot of hiring at that time. And the year that I came, there were four of us who were hired. And then the next year, three, and the next year, four. So it really, you know, enlarged and built, built up the department. Um, but Greg was just, we really hit it off when I flew, flew down for my interview. And there was a great sort of arrival story during which the... <laughs> The guy who picked me up from the airport and his very beautiful brand new wife got lost in a snowstorm trying to drive back to Oxford and took the wrong turn or didn't take a turn. And we ended up at this, you know, mammoth three hour drive through the pitch dark, through the snow, through the Mississippi countryside trying to find Oxford. And all of that just tickled me because it broke the ice so much. Literally. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, sometimes the whole job situation is very stiff and very formal. But this was it's like we're driving down through the dark and we're going, you know, where's Oxford? <laughs> Let me see if I have a map. <laughs> and, um, it was so great. And then Greg was so friendly and so smart and so affable. And we just really hit it off. So um, I kind of wanted to come here and Peter agreed. And it was a, it was an adventure. Um, I certainly had never planned on living in Mississippi. I mean, growing up in Berkeley, Mississippi was not on my list of places to go, you know? Yeah, but, um, I get that. But, yeah, yeah. But, and I, I, in Berkeley, as a teenager, I'd been following the civil rights movement really closely and, you know, very emotionally and kind of politically concerned with that, um, although there wasn't that much I could do about it as a high school student in Berkeley, California. Um but we just wanted to come here and we wanted to um, bring our voices here and find out what it was like. It was, it's been, it's hard to explain because it's very complicated, but it's been a meaningful and rewarding move, you know? Oh, I totally get it. And I mean, yeah. I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just was going to say Mississippi is really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. It's like in so many different ways. It's, it's so culturally complicated and rich and moving and troubling and horrible and beautiful and pretty much anything I could say about it, you know? I mean, for what we do for a living, of course, you writing poetry, me drawing editorial cartoons about politicians, I, there's probably no better place to be because it does seem to, um, I, I don't know, I don't know if it's just the 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 bad helps bring on the good or what whatever the case is but yeah I was I was thinking about that too I wouldn't be half the person I am if I hadn't have moved here I think it's it's mm. been been a good move but at the end of the day I mean I had a crazy interview also and when I came back my wife said well what do you think 
And I said, it was absolutely the craziest interview I've ever had, but I really <laughs> loved the people. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 <laughs> and it sounds like you had a very similar experience uh, as well on yeah. that. You yeah, obviously, I mean, we didn't, that night we didn't get to Oxford until 1130 at night. Oh, my gosh. I had summoned the English department to be at his house to meet me, you know, for a party. Yeah. <laughs> they were all like, nice to meet you, got to go home. <laughs> you know, so. It was, it was great. It was a long time ago, but um, what a memory. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I, I remember when, you know, when I came in, they were like, everybody wanted to go out with, to eat with me. And I thought, wow, they really like me. But it was because they were eating at the fanciest restaurant in town yeah. oh, and they just wanted yeah. a free meal. So I was like, okay. Well, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Lots of good free meals in this business. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. On that. You obviously love teaching and are very good at it, just judging by the awards. Um when you got the LCM Hood Award in 2014, that's that was a pretty big deal, and um, that had to be pretty humbling. To to that was huge. It was huge. Again, I could not believe it. I remember I got a call in my office, and I I went down, and Evo Camps was the chair, and I just sort of he was so sweet. I told him, and he he kind of jumped up and down. He's like, "That's wonderful. That's wonderful." And literally jumping off the floor, you know. But no, I mean, yeah, what an honor. It was just amazing. Well, but yes, I do. I love teaching. I really do. You're listening now. You're talking on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Marshall Ramsey. And we're back with poet and educator, Dr. Ann Fisherworth. Uh, and we were talking about your, your teaching career. And number one, I mean, that had to be really, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've taught two adjunct classes, so I am completely not in your universe when it comes to the whole teaching thing. But I enjoyed that so much because I think I learned, ended up learning as much from the students as they did from me. Yeah, you do. It's such an honor to get to make contact with people that age, you know. And I've thought a lot about it. Why did I love it so much teaching college? And I think it's because people that age are still asking the big questions, you know. Yeah. Like sometimes as we get older and we get so full of obligations and bills and so on and so forth and so used to how we have organized our lives, we forget about those big questions of life and death and the meaning of things and the importance of our role in the universe. And I found that my students, many of them, well, I'll put it this way, if they weren't asking them, they wanted to be able to be asking them, you know, they wanted to be able to get out from under the pressure of anxiety about jobs and grades and so on and, and just really step forward into being fully human, you know. So I loved it. I really did. I was very moved by it. It was hard during the last few years because of COVID and because so many students were struggling so much with COVID and with job anxieties and health problems and so on and so forth. But um, I had a hard time deciding to retire. I taught way past mandatory retirement age or let's say suggested retirement age, you know. Um, I taught for an additional 10 years just because I couldn't imagine not having that contact. But then it was time. And um, now I'm really enjoying what I'm doing now. <laughs> well, what are you doing now? Well, several things. For one thing, um, I'm doing a really fascinating project with a German who was my grad student when I first was in Mississippi. His name is Willie Rousert. And he wrote his dissertation under my supervision. And then he went off and became a professor in Germany. But he's also a really good photographer. And his partner lives in Guadalajara, so he has a lot of connections there. And um, we're doing a collaborative poetry-slash-photography project. It's a kind of eco-arts project. And we just are sort of finishing pulling that together. So I've been writing poems in response to his photographs. And then um, it's going to be translated. My poems will be translated, and it's going to be part of um, an exhibit at the Guadalajara Book Festival next fall. So that's really exciting to me. That's just a whole new, you know, kind of wonderful invitation that I got to respond to. Um, and that's one thing. And then just finished another really wonderful project. So the University of Mississippi English Department has a journal called Global South. And um, my friend Laura Gray Street and I co-edited an eco-arts issue of Global South the general editor is Leanne Duck. And then we had four regional editors from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Oceania. And these regional editors 
helped us solicit and choose poetry and prose and visual art for this special online issue of this journal, Global South. And that's just now, you know, just now ready to come out. Um, And then there's another huge project that I'm going to be working on. As you know, probably, Laura Gray and I co-edited a book called The Eco Poetry Anthology, which is 625 pages of American poetry, U.S. poetry, from Whitman up to about 2010, um, nature poetry, and then when the term eco-poetry started being used, eco-poetry. And it has this wonderful long introduction by the poet Robert Hass. But we've just um, been talking to our publisher, Trinity University Press, about doing volume two, which is going to be eco-poetry from 2010 to 2025. So we're just getting launched off with that, you know, and we'll be issuing a call for submissions and doing all the kind of choosing and organizing and <clears throat> finding new introduction, new prefaces, and so on. So lots, lots of editing. I really enjoy these co-editing projects. That's wonderful, too. And it sounds like you have uh, slowed down exactly not at all. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> it seems to keep me happy. I'm no. kind of... Oh, yeah, I totally yeah. get that. I totally get that. I, I I think, you know, I always think about the football coaches who retire and then they drop the next day kind of thing. It's like, nah, you know, I can't. I, somebody said, when are you going to retire, Marshall? I said, well, probably never, you know, yeah, as, long, as, long, know. Long, as long as I can hold a pen on that. But I, I love the projects that you're working on. And it sounds like they're all very close to, 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 to your passion and to your heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My son, Caleb, said at one point, Mom, you're like a shark. If you stop moving, you die. (laughs) I'm like, oh, well, (laughs) yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I feel so lucky to get to do these things, which are all about, you know, eco arts and environmental consciousness and bringing that awareness more fully into the world. Well, and that's a big part of what you've been doing. I mean, you know, on top of obviously teaching poetry, you also director of the environmental studies up at Ole Miss for a long time. Mm-hmm. And um, you helped develop that program and get it going a little bit. And that had to be in a way kind of hard to walk away from. Yeah, that was. Well, it was. I mean, as I said, it took me several years to feel like I was, it felt like pulling a Band-Aid off, you know, when at first you just can't even stand it. But, you know, you have to keep pulling on it. I knew I had to retire at some point. And I knew that, I would know when the time came and it's just, it just was time, you know, but yes, it was, it was hard. I'm glad to leave that program in really good hands Yeah. with um, Christy Elliott and Deanna Kreisel being the co-directors of the program. And it seems like it's doing really well. Boy, and if it, you know, it's needed as much now as it ever, you know, obviously. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah. you know, like I mentioned before, and of course you were, you were talking a little bit about the the students and how they get to express themselves. And I was just thinking to myself, yeah, there's nothing that, that kills uh, your, your, your courage more than a mortgage, you know, (laughs) so that's like, I gotta pay, I gotta pay the mortgage. But yeah. And I was thinking about, you know, not only did, you know, you allow them to be able to speak what's on their heart and their mind, but you also taught them beautiful ways to being able to do it. And, you know, when I, when I read your poems, you know, just how incredibly powerful they are. And some of them are very personal. I mean, you know, some, and I'm just sitting here flipping through and, I, and I've dog-eared a few that were some of my favorites um, at the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. I love that one. I love The Astonishing Light, uh, which was about, uh, you know, a trip to parchment on that. And y- you, you are literally like a painter when it comes to words. You have this ability to see things. When did you notice that you had the ability to, to see things and to be able to describe them? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, you know, in one of the poems in that book, um, I have a line, and apparently this is something I actually said when I was three. I was riding in my mom's car, and you know how little kids like to kneel on the back seat and look out the back window, or at least pre-car seat days, we could do that. And I was looking out the window, and I said, there's so much to see and so little time to see it. And apparently that kind of astonished my mom. Yeah, that's something, um, yeah, somebody much older, like several decades older would say, yeah. But I would say probably then, it's like just, and again, being an Army brat kind of helped because I was always seeing new places, you know. 
and um, didn't it, it was also a source of pain because I was always the new kid, you know, yeah. one with the wrong shoes and he didn't know the jokes and he had the wrong hairstyle, you know. But um, it helped because I could see things from that point of view of, of estrangement, you know. So I suppose probably way back then, I don't know. I was a very serious little person. <laughs> Were you? Serious. Were you? Yeah, I was. I was, yeah. Kind of old, you know. Old you were an old soul. Yeah. Mind. Yeah. 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 And so you feel like you're kind of doing the Benjamin Buttons thing? You're going backwards now? Getting goofier as I get older, yeah. <laughs> yep. It's all hopeless. <laughs> That's okay, though. That's okay. When you win something like the Governor's Arts Award, you know, like I said, that and for me, whenever, and most of the time, my awards are not to that level, but, you know, they're still nice to win. But do you ever, when you get something like that, do you feel like that's a challenge or do you feel like that's just recognition? I mean, for me, you know, a lot of times when I want to wear, I feel like, okay, now I feel like I need to actually work harder and earn it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I mean, a bunch of stuff, happiness yeah. and a really nice, just kind of glowing feeling of like, oh, wow, you know, that's really amazing. But also, um, yeah, the sort of imposter syndrome is like, mm, if only they knew, <laughs> you know, they would take it right away, you know. Um, no, I think by now, at my age, I've kind of learned to settle into allowing myself just to be happy about something when I'm happy about it. Um you know, and I still have all that old anxieties and competitiveness and self-doubt and so on and so forth that I ever had. But it's really nice to be able to just say, yeah, I feel really happy about that, you yeah. know, and to even say that to other people. Because I think I was kind of raised not to not to be able to say that. It's like it wasn't polite or something, but I think it's just fine. Yeah, it sounds like we were growing up in the same house. I, you know, it's, I'm just <laughs> you're, you're my long lost little brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're making me smile here a little bit. I mean, my dad was in the army, so I don't know, you know, but um, he wasn't in quite as long as your dad. But you were, I mean, you were in Japan, you were in Germany, you were all over the world. But also, too, yeah. thanks to the Fulbright, you've also been able to kind of teach and work all over the world too. You've had tell us a little bit about those experiences. Oh, those were wonderful. We were in Switzerland from 94, 95. Oh, bless your heart. Year. That had to be horrible. Freeboard. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> we could see uh, Mont Blanc from our front window, you know. That nice. was wonderful. Uh, we were in Freeborg, And one nice thing about Freeborg, as it was explained to us, is that it was one of the poorer cities. It's in the French part of Switzerland. So they didn't have the money to modernize, which meant that they – kept all the really old, beautiful buildings and the walls that encircled the city and so on. So it's a gorgeous, gorgeous city. Um, and, you know, now they've had money and they've, they've, modern, they've gotten smart. They've modernized the insides of buildings, but not the outside, you know. And then um, from 2002, 2003, we were in Uppsala, Sweden, and that also was just wonderful. I recently was back in Sweden in February, actually, and I realized just how much I love Sweden. You know, beautiful, beautiful country. You, um, and, uh, yeah, I bet to say it sounds like you you figured out a way to still be able to do some more travel. Well, I hope so. I I do love to travel. Yeah, and of course our kids live all over the place, so that keeps me traveling to see kids and grandchildren. You know. Yeah. yeah. How many grandchildren do you have now? We have six. Wow. Um, I know, age seventeen down to age five, and they're just dear my heart <laughs> they're pretty special yeah do they get to do they ever get to come see you and hang out in mississippi and learn about mississippi they don't really bit? come yeah they don't really come to mississippi much um there's two of them in california two of them in massachusetts and then two of them live down in ocean springs so the ocean springs ones are the mississippians okay well but, that, that works yeah. out pretty well a little yeah bit. yeah you're listening now. You're talking on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Marshall Ramsey. I'm an editorial cartoonist and editor-at-large at Mississippi Today. And I'm back with poet and educator Dr. Ann Fisherworth. And I, I have to admit, I was sitting here reading over your poems over the weekend, and I've, I've read them back in the past. But, I mean, I was reading getting ready for the show. And then I got the book this morning, uh, finally. That's a long story. But I'm glad <laughs> it's finally in my hot hands. Uh, the new book is Paradise is Jagged. That's come out this year. Um, it's a fantastic coll collection uh, of your poetry. Let me ask you a little bit about the creative process because 
as somebody who stumbles and bumbles and tries to be creative myself, and, and I know how I work, um, you know, for instance, I'll see something in my head and I'm either trying to draw it with my physical being able to draw or paint if I'm painting or if I'm writing, I try to describe it in words. That's how it's supposed to work. Sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it happens in the morning just because I'm kind of, that's when I'm used to working a little bit. How does your process work when you come up with an idea for a poem and, and where does it go from there? Oh, so many different ways. Um, I don't necessarily come up with an idea for a poem, you know, because I find that if I know ahead of time what I want to say, then either it needs to be in prose, Mm -hmm. um, you know, more like an essay, or there's no point saying it, it's going to be a dead poem. So A dead poem. I think of, yeah, I think of writing poetry as kind of taking a journey, finding out where it wants to go. And when I'm lucky, that's what happens is that something I would never be able to explain rationally takes over <clears throat> and the words just kind of come, you know? Yeah. Sometimes quickly, sometimes there's one poem in my next to most recent book called Chant d'Amour that took 40 years to write because I had the first stanza and then I could never figure out how to end it, you know? Um, and I tried and tried all kinds of bad ways. And then finally, after 40 years, I'm like, oh, OK, I can do this. You know, um, you write plenty of bad poems that never see the light of day. You know, that would be mortifying if anybody ever happened to stumble upon my laptop and all the stuff on it. Um, and then sometimes it's just like taking dictation. I mean, that's happened to me a few times in my life when um I'm just writing down, and it's like the words are not coming from me. They're coming mm -hmm. through me, but not from me. And that is just the most amazingly wonderful, magical, I would say kind of sacred process when that happens, you know, because you're really tapping in with something bigger than yourself or deeper than yourself. Um, so it just happens all kinds of different ways. I get, I suffer terribly from what I would still call writer's block, which is when I just can't allow myself to feel like I have anything worth saying, you know? But then there's other times when um, stuff will happen much more easily and much more quickly, or something will be going on in my life. Like, for instance, I wrote a series of elegies after my sister died three years ago. Um, you know, so it, it, it's like there's just absolutely no one way to talk about it, <laughs> except that it's a lot of work and it's supremely wonderful when it's wonderful. I've had those moments when I've gotten the cartoon ideas that literally I say came from there. I call them God moments. They come from somewhere else. And those are my, usually my better, better cartoons. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and like I said, those are the days that are easy. And, and I completely understand the writer's block. And I was going to ask you how your process was. I don't say I don't believe in writer's block in the sense that, you know, the only time I have writer's block is when I sit there and stare at the blank piece of paper and think I've got writer's block. You know, so what I start mm -hmm. doing is I just start sketching stuff and it may be 54 ideas that are all garbage. <laughs> But yeah, I know. <laughs> I, but I but I got to get past them, you know. I mean, you you know, yeah. you got to push past it. So you're just sitting there grinding and grinding, and then finally you get a couple, and you're like, okay, maybe I can show my editor this, and it'll be great. Yeah. Is that yeah. kind of how you get through yeah. the process? And I mean, with your when your students come up to you and say, "I've got writer's block," do you just like look at them and go, "Yeah, well, get in line," you know? No. Yeah. Sure. Well, for one thing, um, I think it's really important for writers to be able to share their. Um, they're, what can I say? Everybody like, uh, I, I can't even talk about it very well, but everybody likes to hear a success story. Everybody likes to have a success story to tell. But it's also important for writers to know that the other writers are also human and yeah. also, you know, have struggles and so on. And that's sometimes a little harder for people to admit. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, with students, and one thing to do is just give them automatic free write assignments just to get your hand moving across the page you know if if one would look at all my books in a row you'd see a number of poems that started from the phrase in that kitchen which is just a great prompt for a 20 minute free write in that kitchen because everybody has memories of kitchens associations with kitchens stories about kitchens musings about kitchens you know so whatever so I would tend to give students something like that or give myself something like that and just kind of see where it goes you know yeah. Your poems that that 
deal with and talk about your sister are so incredibly powerful. And, you know, grief is like a bruise. You think it's getting better and then suddenly something hits it and it, it brings it up again and it hurts again. And, and obviously your poetry has been a balm to help, you know, help comfort you during this time of grief. Talk about that a little bit and, and why, I mean, obviously being very public and being very open about your pain also is, is kind of a risk in a way. Yeah. Um, well, my sister, I, so I've, I actually now have no more members of my birth family, which is a weird feeling. Oh, yeah. you know, my parents yeah. died and then my two sisters died within a few years of, of each other. But the one was my half sister and much older and I loved her dearly, but I didn't know her as well. Um, my little sister, actually, I <clears throat> this is going to make me upset, but I was on my way to turn around to give a reading and the phone rang, and this little voice said, Annie, I have cancer. And, um, you know, I said, I'll call you back as soon as we get to the hotel. So we talked then, and she, by the time they found out, she had stage four cancer. Oh. Um, so she died in five months, and that was one of the most devastating and also one of the most sacred times in my life because, you know, we'd always been close, but we'd also always had a lot of kind of sisterly competitiveness or sometimes friction or misunderstanding or whatever, um, as much as we loved each other. But all that just dropped away. And it's like we were just able to be so completely loving to each other and appreciative of each other and real for each other, you know? Um so, so uh, it, it just about destroyed me when she died. I mean, it was so hard, so hard. I kept thinking, this is not supposed to happen. She's the one who ate vegetables and took hikes and lived a much healthier life than I and never smoked, you know. And, and then she has this devastating thing that they just couldn't stop. Um, and so, yeah, writing poems, the poems were... Um, just not only a way of dealing with grief, but also just a way of being in her presence, you know, mm -hmm. um, in my imagination, just being still in her presence and, and articulating the thoughts that I was having, you know, about her. So, yeah. So, and then of course it was COVID <laughs> during yeah. the same time, you know, so I wrote some poems about that as well, you know, but yeah, I'd love to read a couple of poems if you'd like. Oh, please do. Um, please do. Let's see. And I'm trying to decide. I'll read a little one you mentioned about my dad being in Korea. And I'll read a short little one called Childhood. Childhood. How soft were her hands stroking our hair as she sang to us, my little sister and me. Lullabies that curved through the silvery trees. Our father was somewhere called Korea. He wrote to us that children in crimson overalls ran after him for American candy. Now I know that suffering sows the earth with salt. But then I only wondered how the birds slept, feathers puffed out around them in the darkness, what frogs said with their burbling throats, where the mysterious rivers ran. Wow. I had a kind of wonderful I had a wonderful wonderful mother and a wonderful childhood you know and I'll read you a short one about my sister this is one um, called and behind us only air 10 days from death she glows sitting beside me on their deck star scarf wrapped around her head she's leaning toward me I have a cold so I'm leaning away afraid to give her one more thing to fight. And it hurts that someone seeing this photograph might think I'm avoiding her. She's softly smiling at the photographer, her husband, on this, my last visit. I feel messy, unfinished. There's too much of me. I'm too given over to life. And all that has been stripped from her. She has gone beyond grief. Not yet is she skeletal, quite. Wow. Wow. Oh. Well, you're listening, of course, to Ann Fisher-Worth um, in just reading a couple of her beautiful poems. And, and I was thinking about that with your sister. Where did your sister live? Did you have to travel to go see her, or was she close? Or? Yeah, St. Louis. 
St. Louis, outside St. Louis. Outside yeah. St. Louis, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, that made it hard. I'm, and, I, and I know you wanted to probably be there every second that you could during that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I was teaching, too, you know, and yeah. her husband was amazing, and she had a very active community. She was a professor, just like me, and okay. she also was a Unitarian, and she had this amazing church, you know, so um, so she had a lot of love around her. Um, but, yeah, it was hard. It was hard. What does yeah. she teach? English, naturally. <laughs> naturally. <laughs> what else? Yeah. yeah. You know. your, your mom must have had a big smile on her face. Yeah. Do I have time to read you one more poem? Yes, you do. Okay. This is called Jagged Paradise. This is a reverse avicidarian, which is an avicidarian starts out with A, first line, and then B, C. But this one starts out with Z and goes backward. Jagged Paradise. Zing. You're alive, aren't you? X-rays show nothing wrong. Why fight against this happiness? Violets clustering between the bricks on the front walk, under the pecan tree, spider lilies intricate and scarlet. Theo, the tuxedo cat, lapping cream on the porch. Sunlight on the trail this morning warms my love's neck and his worn red shirt. It gilds the bulrushes, silvers the feathery grasses. Quick, look, as we walk, the heron who lives by the little pond rises heavy-bodied into the trees. One ridbeckia, one purple zinnia. Not much else grows where the trail branches off into darkness. Moon tonight is full, sailing around the sky, clouds whipping past. Leaning on my husband, I crook my neck to look up at the sky. Keep him safe, moon and sky. Keep him in your care. My guy in his jeans and hiking boots, his olive-colored olive shirt, and the belt tongue that keeps curling. In my squeaky voice, I sing him, Il y a longtemps que je t'aime. How old we're growing together, him with his toenails sharp as knives, gnarly eyebrows, me with my twisted toes. We love the things we love for what they are, wrote Frost, and it's true. Every cicada sings us closer to winter now. Darkness soaks the grasses, pools beneath the trees. Come here, little one, whoever you may be. The day and night ripen blood-red berries of sumac, dogwood, roses. All the leaves are mottled and stained. Amen. Breathe in. It's late October. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Our, and that, that was great. This is Now You're Talking on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Marshall Ramsey, and I'm back with poet and educator, Dr. Ann Fisherworth. And I, I've really enjoyed the conversation with you. <laughs> Thank and you. Yeah, now, now, now I kind of regret I didn't audit one of your classes. That would have been a lot of fun. I <laughs> Thanks so much. It was really wonderful. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm talking to you. Well, I, I really appreciate it. We got about three minutes here, a little bit. So, there is a budding, budding poet or writer or, or creative person listening right now thinking, okay, I want to do this. I want to be able to teach or I want to be able to write or I want to be able to move the world with my words. What advice would you give them? Uh, read, read so widely and read not only the work of your own generation, but also work of other great writers throughout history. Um, Have an interesting life, you know, have adventures, um, embrace life fully, be persistent, be really persistent, be disciplined with yourself, learn to love to cut. Um, Remember that your poem, you make your poem, but it's not you. So if it gets rejected, it's not that you're rejected. But also just care a lot about making the work better and better, um, honing it, developing it, <clears throat> challenging yourself, um, and then just loving what you do. If you don't love it, don't do it because it's sure not going to make you rich, you know. But if you love it, if you need to do it, it's a great, it's a great way to have a, a, a productive life, a life that feels to you as if it has depth and beauty and 
I know I was thinking about that, the whole make you rich part. And yet I think about your life and all the experiences you've had and the travel and, and your wonderful family. And I would say you're probably one of the wealthiest people I've ever met. <laughs> you're so sweet. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking with me. It was really a pleasure. And I'm a big fan of your, your work as well. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you probably per- remember you uh, interviewed Maud Skyler Clay and me for... TV at one point. And That's that right. Was so fun. That's right. So fun. I was just that was uh, when the Mississippi when the Mississippi came out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and of course yeah. the the new book is is Paradise is Jagged and I want to get Bones of of Winter Birds too. Um, I'm, I'm gonna gonna go get that one as well. And of course you've got I mean several books uh, as well and I didn't even touch on all of them so I feel like terrible. Anyway. All right, That's we got to right. go. Well, these are both of, these are both available from Terrapin Books. That's my plug. <laughs> very good. That's what I needed. Thank you very much. And your website real quick before we go. Oh, just annfisherworth.com. That's easy enough. And I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I appreciate it. Well, I tell you what, what a great show today. I appreciate it. I want to say thank you for listening and special thanks to our guest, Dr. Ann Fisherworth, for joining me today. And if you'd like to hear this or any past episodes, subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app or on our MPB public media app. Now You're Talking is a production of MPB Think Radio with episode and podcast produced by Jermaine Flood. So stay tuned for Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. It's coming up next. And join us again next Monday at 10 a.m. I'm Marshall Ramsey. Y'all have a great week. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.